Hi, my name is Alastair Matchett. I'm an ex-investment banker. I used to work at JP Morgan and then worked in private equity. I work for a financial edge training company who teaches most of the invest new investment bankers on Wall Street and in the city of London. The BBC have just come up with a new show called Industry and it's all about people that we teach joining the investment banks. And it's a great program, but I want to take you through some of the things that are true, a little bit true or not true at all. The first thing they're talking about is the interview process. Let's just take a look. I've never seen anyone put their IQ on a CV before. How many of these have you had? Nine. Four in New York, four here, and uh, Skype. Why are you here then? Now here they're talking about the number of interviews a candidate has, and it's not a at all unusual to have 12 interviews for one firm. Typically those initial interviews will be online. Now typically what you'll do is you'll get a screen and they'll flash up a question, not from a person but just a computer, and you have to answer the question and then I'll have AI in the background that will compare your answer to the answer people in the organization have made, um, the successful people, and they'll see if there's a correlation there. Then of course you have real interviews with real people, but it's not unusual for you to have a lot of interviews. Well, it's not a very political answer, but I think mediocrity is too well hidden by parents who hire private tutors. I am here on my own. I want to be able to explain myself clearly um, and have people be receptive to my ideas. Is that how you get your validation? People listening to you? As opposed to... Uh... Every successful business is full of people who've spent money nurturing unremarkable talent. Why did you read Geography? Geography had the least amount of applicants the year before. You know, it's a marginal game about marginal gains. Now, I don't think a lot of these questions really reflect the kind of questions you get in an investment banking interview. They certainly want to know about you. They generally know that you're smart because they'll have target schools and that tends to be the top schools. They have broadened than that in recent years because technology makes it much cheaper to recruit. Previously, they could only afford to go to the main schools because it cost about $50,000 to go to each school to recruit just in terms of what you have, the fees you have to pay to the um, university and just getting people there as well. So they have broadened the net, but the kind of interviews you would have will typically focus on your background, go through your CV, get a little understanding of you, what your leadership qualities are, attention to detail, and you tell those through stories. But in addition to that, you get some pretty tough questions like, what is seven ninth as a decimal, which I got asked in my interview, or value the size of the UK Thai industry? And they will be pretty tough to answer. And I think the industry TV show doesn't really capture some of the harder questions. And some of the questions they ask are kind of inappropriate. You generally wouldn't have that. Generally, it would be a pretty professional process. Nothing wrong with the back door. I play third fiddle to two figures in my mother's life. Jesus Christ and Margaret Thatcher. And where do you stand on them? One's the reason we're all here and the other's a carpenter. I think this is the closest thing to a meritocracy there is. And I only ever want to be judged on the strength of my abilities. And paid for it. Now, I think that's true. Investment banking has changed. Gone are the days of people getting there just because they knew someone in the firm. It's much, much more likely that you're going to have some very, very competent, very ambitious individuals in the firm. And it's unlikely that you'll get a job or certainly you won't progress with the firm if you just got there through connections or your parents who are some kind of client of the organization. Those days are gone. So generally speaking, the people who get the jobs tend to be really at the top of their game. I guess. I didn't realize that we recruited from SUNY Binghamton. It's a non-target. Can you tell us a joke? Um, uh, yeah. Uh, uh, it's a bit for work, um, whatever. You know how many mountains I'd have to move to get you to London for good?
generally, when people think of investment banking, they think of exactly what we're looking at, a trading floor. And the reality is that this is only part of what an investment bank is. There are really two sides of investment banking, mainly because they're two types of client. On the one side, you have got the investors, people who want to invest money, pension funds, hedge funds, investment funds. And on the other side, you've got corporates and governments who want to raise money. So the trading floor that we're looking at is very much servicing the investor clients, people who want to buy securities or sell the securities that they have. However, there's another big side of an investment bank, which is typically known as corporate finance or typically in an American firm, the investment banking department, which is kind of confusing because it's a subset of an investment bank. And what they will do, they will service the corporates and the governments and essentially act as financial advisors or people who want to raise money or raise capital or invest by buying whole companies or whole assets. We were on his catamaran and then the guide caught some grouper and fried it on the side of the boat. <laughs> yeah, it was beautiful. Hey, ask Rishi for the level of one year, one year euro swap in 500 KDB01. Don't call me promiscuous. Rishi. Today, please. Oh, yeah, no, I'm very well. Rishi. So here we're looking at an interaction between uh, the person in sales, woman, and she's talking to Rishi, the trader. And the salesperson is going to interact with the actual investors, but the trader will manage a book of inventory of securities. And he's making a bid and offer price. So the price at which he will buy the security at from the client and the price at which he will sell the security at. And the interaction between there with the trader making constant prices, both to buy the security and to sell the security, and the salesperson interfacing with the client, managing the client relationship. Can you send- Relax, it's not an auction house. I've just sent out my runs, they're on your bloomy. You can sit down now. So Harper, Harper. Hi. Uh, sorry, I just catch my breath. Sure. Cycled in. Hmm. Uh, yes, uh, I still don't have your university transcript. I'm really sorry, I will get on it. Now this is unlikely to happen. In this case, Harper is actually in the office, in the building, got access to all the systems, and she hasn't given over a key piece of information about her background, which is her transcripts. In most cases, banks will do a thorough investigation on people before they get in the door. And often that's done by security companies. And it's highly unlikely that you'll be able to get in the door without giving your university transcripts. And not only that, the security firm doing the investigation will check that they are accurate. So it's actually really unlikely that this would happen in real life. <laughs> Are you that thirsty? Well, you know, you've got a 30 quid meal allowance. Like, why would you not use all of it? That's fair enough. How's your model? We'll finish it in the morning. Send it over my way. I've got capacity. Now here, these two people are working in investment banking, or IBD, investment banking department, or division. Now, you'll notice the two, that it's a big difference between the trading floor. The trading floor was quite buzzy. There were people shouting. They had the TV going, probably Bloomberg. But in this case, it's quite it's like a library. And they're hunched over um, computers. And they're typically using things like Excel and PowerPoint. And he's talking about a model. And what he means is a financial model in Excel of a company, a forecast of its financial statements or a valuation model. And that's a lot of what the work is going to be in the investment banking department, but it's quiet like a library. Capacity. Brutal finance guy, isn't it? I don't know what that is. You're bouncing. Hey, man, hey, it's only 10.15. No one here is actually going to tell you this, but you need to put in FaceTime. Actually, I don't. Now, there's been a big effort in recent years to reduce what is known as face time, where you have to just be in the office late. When I started out, we had our standard hours were 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. In other words, the minimum hours you expected to be in the firm. But regularly, we were there to 10, 11, 12, or even 1 a.m. or 2 a.m. And so that's not unusual. 
And in some cases, people would spend an overnight working through right through the night if there was a deadline to get a pitch out. Sometimes people do tricks like leaving their jacket on the back of their chair to it make it look like they're in the building somewhere, just not at their desk, but they were still at work. But it's still a big issue. You'd be have to be prepared to work late, but only in investment banking, not in the training floor. In the training floor, you have to get in super early, typically at your desk, at the latest by 7 a.m., but you'll typically be able to to leave pretty early as well, usually around 5, 6, or 7. No, well, that doesn't enhance my work. Mate. Mate! Oh my god, I'm gonna be a host. I don't think you really wanna. I wanna see this video in my. See you later. See you on. So you can see here, the training floor is all dark, they've all gone home, but the guys in EBD, they're working hard and they will be working for many hours after the training floor has gone home. Now here, there's a couple of things. Firstly, the guy is snatching some sleep in the loo, but actually people wouldn't normally do that. Typically they'd sleep under their desk and it doesn't happen a lot, but I certainly have known some people actually just literally to sleep on a couch in a meeting room or sleep under their desk in the times that they have had to go through all the night and they just needed a break. But the one thing that isn't true here is that there's no one else around and the reality is even at one o'clock in the morning you'd expect to see quite a few analysts still working on their models and here this this guy is just on his own in the floor and that would be something that would be pretty unusual why have you changed the whack the dcf was coming out too low well how's it compared to the transaction comps these be profit unicorns trade on crazy multiples eight times nine times this liquidity discount would be just over the dcf mm, fantastic so here you've got the associate, the woman, talking to the analysts, or maybe their interns, and they're talking about the valuation of a company. And she's got a pitch book in her hand, and she's talking about the WAC, which is the weighted average cost of capital, and the DCF, which is the discounted cash flow valuation. Now, a discounted cash flow valuation is a way of valuing a company by forecasting its cash flows forward and discounting them back to today using the WAC. And that gives you under normal circumstances, if you don't include any synergies from an acquisition, the standalone value of a company that you would normally compare to trading comparables, the value of companies, comparable companies in the stock market. So the first issue here is that comparing a DCF to transaction comms wouldn't normally happen unless you're including the synergy value within the DCF. And I don't think that they're doing that here. So that seems wrong. The second thing is that he's saying that they're crazy multiples, eight to nine times. Now, he doesn't make clear what kind of multiple he's talking about, but if he's talking about PE multiple, eight to nine times would be a really, really low multiple, not a high multiple. If he's talking about a multiple of EBITDA, then again, that would still be pretty low, eight to nine times. The S&P 500 trades about 11 to 14 times EBITDA. So that definitely technically is not correct, saying that eight to nine times multiples are low. They've definitely got that wrong. What's that? That's my model. Why are you doing the model? Gus is doing the model. I had capacity. I just want to get ahead. Sorry, I told you to do the pitch book. So do the fucking pitch book, okay? Hungerfix want to optimize delivery speed. So they're looking at mid caps or best in class GPS tech. Clear comps, Deliveroo, Uber Eats. I found something with good sat nav IP. They're quite small. Don't fucking fish, stick to the formatting. And for fuck's sake, make sure the fonts Helvetica 12 or the MD will freak. Now here, the associate's kind of going off, screaming at the analysts. Now, that will sometimes happen, but if you do that a lot, you're not going to get the best out of your analysts. So it's pretty unusual to be some, somebody be, to be so unprofessional. It will happen now and again, but I doubt it would happen on a regular basis. These tend to be pretty reasonable people. Sure, they do get stressed, but they tend not to be performing when they treat people like this. That's, that would be pretty unusual. Now, you'll notice it's made a big deal of the formatting. Now, that definitely does happen. 
I can remember building a model where I had to get every single indent exactly right, completely consistent, and you'll have things like house fonts that you must use. And people get very upset if they're not done properly. And it normally be a kind of big black mark. You won't get fired over it, but people will expect really high attention to detail. So things like formatting really do matter in the job. Right, okay. Um... So I've published a piece looking back at the decade post-crisis. Three stages, housing, 2007 to 2009. How are we supposed to monetize what's in the rearview mirror? Um, Any new buy recommendations? Still overweight with a preference for the US. Even with margin. So in this case, you've got a meeting and that two types of people in the meeting. The blonde guy at the end is the research analyst and he is writing stuff about the markets and about companies and publishing them and the rest of the people are the salespeople and Harper's one of them and he will write a document and it will get given to the salespeople and they will use that as a story that they can call the clients on and they'll say well our research analysts have just published this really want to talk about it and this could be a reason that they you should trade this particular stock that we know you hold because we have a sense of what you've bought and sold in the past and so this again is the sales and trading side of the bank not IBD there's one called with bacon no stilton and the other one without no 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 with sorry the first one I need with bacon um thank you and uh, oh, sorry I specifically said no dressing so in this case she is one of the interns is going into the store to buy some food some lunch for the people on the trading floor and that definitely happens as the intern you will get asked to do some menial jobs like that not all the time and i think gone are the days where they really abuse you but that definitely is things that you would um do certainly in ibd you get things asked to do things like photocopying and it used to be a joke that um, you could get a Xerox tan because you've done so many photocopying that actually the light from the photocopy would give you a tan. You need to get out of here. Why? You've only left the building once in the last 48 hours. It's automatically red flagged by your ID card. I don't want to know where you've been sleeping, but optically I need you to walk out of the office, tap your card out, do whatever, then come back. No more red flag. Okay. Sorry. You're not in trouble. I appreciate how you're meeting the needs of the business. Get rid of the fucking water, yeah? So, in this case, the boss, the associates coming up to the analyst and saying, you know, you haven't left the building, we're tracking you. They absolutely will track people. They will track their ins and outs. But it's unlikely that they would um, say to this person, you haven't left in 48 hours. There probably would be some concern. Again, I think gone are the days that people would be expected to work 48 hour um, shift straight. That's pretty unlikely to happen, but you certainly definitely be tracked and everything you do on your computer is tracked as well. And sometimes you go to certain websites, there'll be literally a red flag and literally compliance will come around and say, what have you been looking at in your computer? And sometimes even terms in your emails or instant messenger chat will be picked up by the um, systems that are literally trawling and recording everything that is done on computers or on your phone. And certainly in the trading floor, in many cases, you won't be allowed to bring your personal phone onto the trading floor. You can only use the bank systems and that's where they control everything that is going on. And they do that primarily because you've got a lot of price sensitive information and they want to protect against things like fraud. So um, does she have a does she have a horn button? looking into the business you did with right uh priorities so here you've got a scene where you've got harper who works with the sales team and the asset management or fund management client who's kind of slightly obnoxious and you will often find that the investment bank where they will kind of bend over backwards to help their clients particularly on the sales and trading side they'll spend a lot of the evenings at dinners with clients. Some of them will be really lovely and nice to work with, but sometimes they can be obnoxious. With the president bulldozing the reputation of US overseas, you know, for me it follows that the administration will totally kill the rep of treasuries. And pissing in China's mouth isn't going to help. Exactly. Personally, I just think we're due an enormous sell-off. We're low-key throwing ourselves in cold wars with all of our trading partners. China are the biggest global holder of US paper. If they start dumping, yields will soar past 4%. 
So here you can see Harper's talking to the client and she's pitching an investment idea. And this is really the salespeople's bread and butter. They pitch a good investment idea, they'll get a trade out of it, and they'll get a commission. Now, she's saying that China's the biggest holder of um, US treasuries. And that was true until actually June this year when Japan overtook China. Um, so this is largely accurate. It does reflect the kind of pitching of the ideas that you get between the salespeople and the investor clients. In this case, the woman who's an investor is probably working as an asset manager or fund manager, maybe even a hedge fund manager. If you think the house is burning down, this is how you monetize it. Well, bearish people lose money in this market. Yeah, but the world's pregnant with terrorists. Right. And this is a play for the end. So the client here has just mentioned tail risk. And what tail risk is, is this idea that unlikely events are more likely to happen. And it comes from something called a normal distribution. And the normal distribution is the bell curve. So if you just rank all the population according to their heights on a graph, it would look like a bell curve. And a lot of financial securities trade on the basis of their price volatility being very, very similar to a normal distribution or a bell curve. Now, in this case, she's talking about tail risk. And what the tail risk is, is the bottom ends of the bell curve. So the likelihood of very dramatic price changes. And that's what they mean when they say tail risk. And sometimes where the tail risk is elevated, it's known as fatty tails, where the, the tails are, are elevated in that normal distribution. So that's what they're talking about here. Robert, uh, I've noticed that uh, rates and FX and all the other teams start their meeting pre-open. When does the CPS one start? Um, oh, it, it changes day to day. Eric's not usually in it, so it's Clement's call. Well, um, I'd like it to run from seven from now on, starting tomorrow. Can you just round everyone up for me? So here, in this case, they're talking about the morning meeting, and that's a key meeting that happens on the trading floor. So all the teams get in, and at 7 a.m., they'll have a meeting, and they typically will have the economist or one of the research people talk about what's going on in the markets and what's expected to happen, any big numbers that are going to be announced. And it really kind of kicks off the day, and then the salespeople go off, and they can talk to their clients and give them the ideas, often that have come out and been pitched in that morning meeting. So it's a key thing, often around 7 o'clock in the morning, everybody would be expected to be in by that moment. By that time. So in sales and trading, you've got a really early start, whereas IBD, you probably may start about 8 a.m. or 9 a.m. Now you can see here, Harry has just realized he's made a mistake in the pitch book. He's got the font wrong on one of the pages. Now, the font is likely to probably be the bank's font. So the peer point font that he should have used. It would be an embarrassing mistake. It probably wouldn't be such a dramatic mistake as something like a number being wrong, but the absolute thing he should do, he should tell his boss, because it's much, much better to be able to know what the mistake is way ahead of the client meeting, so at least you can manage it rather than being wrong-footed by the client. Now, he tries to change it, but of course, that's going to be a really difficult thing to do if the client meeting is going to happen very, very soon and all the book has been printed. Hello. Nicole, hi. It's Harper from Pierpoint. That afternoon idea we talked about? It was a fun night. Let's go for it in half a yard. Rishi. Again. Rishi. Yeah, I'll call Rishi, again. I said your fucking name, dude. Can you price that option idea we talked about? Half yard? No way. It's wingier than the fucking lottery. And how the hell have you got someone to buy an option on treasury yields hitting 4%? I told her that eventually the US is going to war in the South China Sea. When they do, this pays out. All right, can do it in half her amount. Nicole, can we do half? No, you want to write my business, you fill me on my first order, in full. Two sex. Needed in full. Can you help? No fucking way. I can't price it without losing money. That's half a billion. The client will not hear no, and I'm not interested in that either. Offers five beeps. Offers five basic points? Too high. I'll pay four cents and up to 250. Work the balance for you. Can't do five. Four, please. They're paying for your idea. Make them fucking pay. Four cents. Four cents. Because I'm excellent, four cents. Do I just say done? Half a yard done, four cents. Half a yard done, four cents. Let's see where this takes us. 
So Harper has landed the deal. That idea she pitched the client during dinner has come to fruition. And what she did, she asked the trader for a price for half a yard. And half a yard is a half a billion dollars. A yard is a billion dollars. And often traders will talk in, in that kind of slang. And they priced it because it's an option and it's effectively a put option, the right to sell that amount of treasuries at a fixed price. They priced it in basis points, which is one basis point is one one hundredth of a percent. So in this case, four basis points based on the par value of 500 million treasury bonds is actually a fee of $200,000 for the right to buy that put option, which gives the holder the right to sell half a billion treasury bonds at a fixed price sometime in the future. Papa. Hey. Have you been home? You're just, like never in your room and you're wearing an identical outfit to yesterday? Ah, well, I'm logging those nocturnal hours, trying to make a good impression, you know? Don't try to figure out how much you get paid by the hour in IBD because I will guarantee you it is less than minimum wage. Well, the way I see it, I'm in the ivory tower upstairs. You're down here on the floor with the peasants. Now, this is a really interesting interaction because it, it tells you two things. The kind of snobbery value when it comes to IBD. So IBD definitely think there's a slightly cut above the trading floor. And that definitely is true. The, the IBD people think they're slightly more intellectual and they're dealing with kind of really important clients compared to the trading floor, which is almost a little bit like a kind of farmyard, people going up shouting and screaming. So that is true. And certainly people do talk about the hourly rate in IBD <laughs> being lower than minimum wage. But I don't think that's quite true because even if you just take the base salary and assuming no bonus, the new analysts will typically get paid about 50,000 pounds a year. And assuming that they take about four weeks of holiday a year and they work about six days a week, so they have one day off and they on average do 12 hour days. I think this is probably the top end of how people work. That means that they would work about 3,456 hours a year. And that translates into about 14 pounds, 47 pence per hour. And the minimum wage is about eight and a half pounds. So it's definitely more than minimum wage. However, what is super true is it's a pretty low hourly rate for the amount of time and effort that you're putting in. And you certainly give up your life if you go to IBD in terms of your personal life and being able to go out a lot. You can go out and it's certainly got better than in the past, but this is a, just a really um, interesting reaction. So it is certainly true that IBD think they're definitely above the trading floor, but in terms of the minimum wage, no, the, the hourly rate is higher, but it's still pretty low from what you'd expect. So that's the first installment of industry. Some real truths about investment banking, but also some things that have been definitely hyped up.